Where else can you get a brand new luxury car for no money down and low monthly payments? Only at Davenport Auto Park, of course. We're talking new Buicks. Top of the line, king of the hill, pick of the litter, cream of the crop. You get my drift. We're talking Buicks, like the 2015 Encore or Verano, Regal Turbo, LaCrosse, Enclave. No money down, zero, zilch, nada. Yeah, only at Davenport Auto Park. It's the real deal. So to put it in mathematical context, if we receive $5 in new revenue that we didn't have before from the 2,600 employees at Metropolitan Life, we will rebate or refund or reimburse the company after we've received the money $1.50. And we do that for a period of 12 years. Of the remaining money, the $3.50 of our $5, 50 cents goes into something called the utility fund, which goes to support and build infrastructure in the bottom 80 least economically advantaged counties in the state. The top 20 cannot participate in this fund. So we're up to a grand total of $2 of the five. The other three, goes to the Treasury, to the State of North Carolina, to the General Fund. And when Metropolitan Life makes a decision to come to North Carolina, do you think it's a 12-year decision? The answer is, of course not. It's a 50-year decision. So we keep 100% of those proceeds from year 13 to 50, and hopefully from year 50 to 100. So all the consternation we're having in the General Assembly about passing the most important incentive legislation is patently absurd. We should be wanting to do a hundred JD deals a day because from the beginning it returns money to the Treasury <coughs> from day one. We reimburse after we receive the money we only reimburse on the actual number of jobs created. If they say 2,600 and only create 2,000, their reimbursement is reduced proportionally. If they pick up and leave the state, we have a clawback provision that, that requires them to pay back all the money. And the two clawbacks I know about happened in the last several years. Both have been recovered in full. The single most important program we have in the state of North Carolina to recruit a company to your site is in limbo. Governor McCrory asked in the State of the State speech that the General Assembly pass this legislation in a matter of weeks, not months. If you remember correctly, for those of you who follow, the General Assembly failed to pass this legislation last session. So I come to Commerce from Diener, having fought the coal ash wars, <laughs> not that behind us, thinking I was going to Commerce, and in my mind I said there is no way they couldn't realize that they made a terrible mistake last time not getting this legislation passed. I figured they were going to listen to the governor three weeks, the House stepped up, and it was two to three weeks. And they passed legislation doing two key things that we need to have. One is, in North Carolina, unlike South Carolina, the General Assembly chooses to cap the amount of this money we can use. It creates net dollars to the Treasury day one, and yet the General Assembly has chosen to cap the amount we can use. So we have to be very judicious in how we make these awards. South Carolina, no cap. We want all comers. All business that's legal is good business. And they are aggressive. I talked to a gentleman the other night who's got a 
ten million dollar expansion with 70 jobs. South Carolina is calling him at home at night. I'm not sure we could offer a JDIG on that scenario because we don't have right now, we, could, we can't offer it right now, we have no cap. We are out of cap. We get more cap July 1, but the whole program sunsets at the end of this year. South Carolina, there's no sunset. It just rolls, which is what we should have in North Carolina. So what the, the House did very quickly is they increased our cap, it's still cap, and they extended the program to 2020 because not only do we need cap, we need to give the marketplace certainty that North Carolina is in the game. Because what do we all want in life? We all want personally, we want certainty. Certainly every corporation wants that too. And the fact that we are not in the game is not helpful at this point in time. I had a gentleman come up to me in Greensboro the night, a very successful businessman, said, I just got back from South Carolina visiting with Governor Haley. She came up and thanked me for being from North Carolina. Another gentleman who's with a major corporation that does a lot of work in North and South Carolina said, I finally figured it out. A, a South Carolina member of the a legislature told me, he said, the reason we're beating you, because our House and our Senate and our governor are all on the same page of the hymn book, and we let the governor be the quarterback. Not the case in North Carolina. What the answer is, as I said to some, I said to Russell earlier, from your mouth to God's ear. I don't know the answer. The Senate has this idea that if we are a zero income tax and a zero corporate tax state, that companies will come to North Carolina or companies will choose to stay and grow in North Carolina simply because of the tax environment. As Chris will verify, there are a lot of states in the Southeast that have a better tax environment than we do. We have a good tax environment. We dropped corporate and individual rates dramatically last session. There are triggers in that legislation that said if revenues hit certain plateaus, we'll drop it some more. We haven't hit those triggers. But the Senate, for some reason, believes that a zero tax environment will be the only thing that's necessary. The reality is there are states with better tax environments. There are states with zero personal income tax environments, Texas, Tennessee, Florida. They all have incentive packages. And as a rule, those incentive packages are better than North Carolina's. I wish I could tell you that there was a magic answer. I wish I could tell you that there was something immediately pending that was going to break this log jam? I can't tell you that. We are, we have, uh, we have begged, pleaded, cajoled, tried to educate everyone we can. Please re-educate people about the fact that the Job Development Investment Grant is not a college scholarship. You know, you recruit the greatest high school basketball player in the country to come transform your program. And they get a grant in aid. Everybody thinks it's a college scholarship. They get tuition, meals, books, room, board, whatever else you get in the package. And if you never score a basket, you still get the money, right? Everybody thinks that our incentive programs are college scholarships, and they're not. So part of my plea to you is please help educate everyone that this major incentive program is not only necessary and absolutely imperative for us to be competitive, but it is a net return to the Treasury day one. We shouldn't have a cap, we shouldn't have a sunset, and we should be able to use this continuously to help create growth in the state. I'll close with, uh, with just one other observation about, about the General Assembly and people that make the rules. 
I had a senator say to me the other day, I'm tired of my rural county supporting uh, Mecklenburg, Wake, and Durham. This JD program has costed my county. And I said, Senator Hallam, because we're financially supporting. I said, do you even understand how the program works? Didn't have the foggiest idea that it was not a college scholarship. And this is a person making the rules for the state of North Carolina with a vision of being able to use these incentive monies to force people where they don't want to go. Do we really think that Mercedes-Benz is going to put their corporate headquarters in Rutherfordton? It's not going to happen. All the incentive money in the world is not going to force companies to go where they don't want to go. Conversely, and I said to this person, I said, do you think a major automotive manufacturer is going to locate in downtown Charlotte? That's why you have been so great and so foresighted and worked so hard to have a location that is conducive to causing a major manufacturer to come. And I don't want to put all our money on an automobile manufacturer. There's lots of other things that get made in this world. There's food packaging. There's food processing. There's aerospace. There's a lot of things that can be accommodated by your site. And we are committed to making that happen. Well, I took all my time on one topic, so I'll, uh, I'll sit down and shut up. But uh, thank you for your hospitality. We are going to make something happen here. You guys have been absolutely wonderful. Your leadership has been absolutely wonderful. And if it becomes a choice of Oppie and the pit bull, I'm taking the pit bull. Thanks for having me. Now I want to introduce uh, Mr. Whit Tuttle. Uh, Whit is the executive director of Visit and See, and he has more than 20 years of experience in the tourism industry. So he looks a lot younger than he is. Um, he's also on the board of the U.S. Travel Association. And Whit uh, is, and I, and I don't say this lightly, there's a lot of marketing is thrown around very loosely. It's thrown around very loosely here. It's thrown around very loosely everywhere. Everybody who uh, has bought a newspaper ad feels like they can be a marketing executive, executive the next day. Whit really is a guru when it comes to marketing. Because of the work of him and his team, North Carolina is, again, sixth in the nation for overnight stays. That's sixth in the nation. So we, that's the first thing. And I'll give you a, a more of a personal story to introduce Whit. Uh, three years ago, I went to the first Governor's Conference on Tourism. And that's where I met Whit and his team. And through some of their breakout sessions and just the incredible data and research that they do to drill down and make sure that they're targeting effectively and communicating and telling the story of North Carolina, we came back in at our properties at the Double Tree Comfort and the Gateway Center. We immediately changed the whole scope of everything we were doing and focused our strategy on selling an experience and not selling rooms. And because of that, we saw immediate returns on our investment and we got groups and have received uh, national press that we wouldn't have received and we had not learned the information and the tactics and the strategies that the uh, Division of Tourism now, Visit NC, uh, implements and, and lays out for communities across the state who are smart enough to apply them. So we are fortunate to have Whit in this community um, here today to make this speech. and. Um, Please help me welcome Mr. Whit Todd. Thanks. Uh, thank you, David. I appreciate it. Um, I'm, I, I guess I'm one of those starry-eyed marketing guys, so I'm excited about that. Uh, and I'm, I'm doing what David told me. He told me to, to give you guys a, a, a kind of look at what's going on, what we're doing for marketing, and what's going on uh, that, that can be applicable to Rocky Mount. Uh, and I'm starry-eyed about Rocky Mount as well. You know, I think. Uh, this place is amazing. The bones here are just uh, are fantastic for business as well as tourism. Uh, and I think the future, the sky really is the limit. Uh, now, Teresa is going to help me out on a, on a presentation. I'm going to show you something. I'm the marketing guy, so I like big pictures and that and things to help me showcase what's going on. So we'll, we'll go to the first slide. Uh, what we talk about is uh, we, we're not the Division of Tourism anymore. We're part of the Economic Development Partnership, which I really appreciate. I appreciate the ability to be here today and throw my water around. And, but uh, that's because tourism is economic development, uh, and, and we're proud to be part of that. Now, what we do as the Visit North Carolina, as opposed to the Division of Tourism, is exactly the same thing. Our job is to get people to come here, spend money, 
and then leave. Okay, that's great. That's what we want you to do. Spend your money and then go home. Uh, and, and we focus our efforts on that. We don't have a big budget, so the way we do that is we have to leverage strategic partnerships uh, to manage that money and, and go out and find creative ways to market the state. What we do, uh, I wanted to look at uh, the impact of tourism, uh, and the best way we look at it is lodging indicators. Um, we set records in 2013 for the state in every one of these lodging indicators, uh, and we're looking at the numbers full year 2014 now, and it's great to see that as a state, we were beating all those records. Now, we look at uh, North Carolina as opposed to the U.S., we also look at the South Atlantic, that's really our heavy competitive set. Uh, the fourth item down there, if you look, is uh, room revenues. And if we beat our record by more than 10% on room revenues, uh, that's a fantastic year for us. Uh, but what I look at is the fifth uh, statistic, and that's uh, demand. It's our job as the tourism office to generate that demand, people wanting to come here. So if we can beat our record, which we set in 2013, we're really proud of that as well. Uh, and, and we talk about 2013 is the last year we have the full economic impact figures. And this is tourism spending. As Chris said, it's a $20 billion industry in the state. We're really proud of that. It is economic development at its heart, uh, tourism. And it's not just $20 billion. It's a billion dollars that comes back to the state of North Carolina. It goes into that treasury and helps fund all kinds of other programs. It's employment for 200,000 people. And yes, tourism employment runs the gamut from low-wage jobs to, to higher-wage jobs. And what I think is real important is that it, it runs this spectrum of the life cycle of someone. We have jobs for people that are in high school that need that, that start. We have jobs for college students that need that to help further their education. And then we have full-time jobs for people that are in the industry. And then we even have jobs for people that are on the other end, that are about to retire, that are looking to help to do part-time. Uh, and those drag our wage figures down. But I think that's important that we can help people find employment and be engaged in your community throughout their life cycle, even into retirement through volunteerism. That's really important for us to, to highlight for the industry. Uh, David asked me to, to talk about what's going on specifically here in uh, Nash and Edgecombe County. So these are the, uh, the spending figures. Now, as you saw, this is 2013 data. Uh, the state is up about 5%. Uh, and you can see here down the bottom, this is really the whole Northeast region. And the Northeast region is, is, is behind the state. You can see as a region, you guys were only up 2.3%. And you're essentially flat in Nash and Edgecombe. Uh, and, and there's nothing wrong with being flat coming out of the environment we've been in the last few years. But we really want to see that start to increase and, and get to the point where the rest of the state is going, where, where it goes up. Here's a, a specific look at, at the counties and uh, what's going on, not just uh, with expenditures, but also payroll, employment, state tax revenue, and local tax revenue. So as you can see there, uh, tourism is a big in these two counties. It's important to the counties. Your location is, is prime. Uh, as it relates to being in the, in the transportation areas, uh, but there's a lot more we can do. Um, and what I wanted to show were some of the counties that really have had large increases in this year. And what you'll see about a lot of these counties is they're all counties that have focused on their uh, downtowns and, and bringing, that, bring, bringing that out, bringing the business out, making it a focus of what's going on for visitors. Because you can't just market a hotel room. And that's one of the things we talked with David about originally is you're not selling a hotel room. Yeah, you have a, a hotel room. You're selling the experience somebody has when they come and they stay in that hotel room. So next I'm going to talk about how to get visitors here. And I, I took a lot of these, these uh, from a guy named Roger Brooks who does a fantastic job talking about marketing to downtowns. Uh, one of the most important things, what do people do when they visit, when they come here to visit? Well, these are all the things people do for North Carolina. And of course, most people are visiting friends and relatives, but what they're really doing is they're trying to spend money. Uh, they're coming out here, they're shopping, they're doing the dining, they're doing museums. They want to spend money when they come here. It's our job to get them to spend that money. What are some of the best ways? Well, Roger has a fascinating uh, stat here, and it's a really the average visitor, they're active for 14 hours in your community. Now, the primary activity that brings them here is only a small fraction of that time. So, okay, they may come and they may just be stopping by overnight on the way to someplace else. So that's fine. But they have those hours in your community that they can spend and they can fill that time spending. You have to make sure they know they can spend. Uh, and so that's where the secondary activities are. The fascinating thing is that secondary activities contribute 80% of visitor spending. 
So even though they're coming for something else, they're spending more of their money on other things. Because typically the things we travel for aren't really the things we put a lot of the money into. Uh, you know, we don't travel to eat typically, but you're going to want to eat in a nice restaurant. And if you've got a restaurant that's specific to that area, locally, authentic, people love that. And they're willing to spend on that. And that's where they're spending the money. So it's important to keep that in mind. And how do you get people to come? Well, curb appeal. Uh, this study shows that curb appeal is responsible for 70% of the spending in most of these places. People aren't, they read a brochure, but the eye test is what makes it. If the place looks like it's inviting to a visitor, they're going to stop. If it doesn't look inviting, if it's got that thing that just doesn't feel right, they're not going to stop. And you're going to lose almost 70% of that spending. So that's really key. Uh, and one of my favorite things Roger talks about is, is night equals life. Um, and I have a personal story here. Uh, it relates to a little town called Banner Elk. And um, we, I, I drive to Banner Elk a lot. I love the coast and I love the mountains and I love North Carolina. My wife loves Banner Elk and in their chamber they have a, 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 a sign, they have a little tag that says just be, B-E, Banner Elk. My wife loved that. It was like, oh gosh, I love that. So I'm a good husband. I tried to go, I said I'm going to go get her a t-shirt that says just be, right? So I've been to Banner Elk I think probably 11 times uh, and the, the Chamber of Commerce Visitor Center has never been open any one of those times I've gone up there. Why? Because I'm not going there on Wednesday on 2 o'clock. I'm going at night and on the weekends because that's when people travel. And if you're not open, when people travel, they can't spend their money there. And that's a huge problem we have with people. And I understand some people don't want to work on a Sunday. They don't want to work after 5 o'clock. But that's when visitors want to spend. And if you want them to spend, you need to be open during those times. And then Roger has great things. He calls it the 10 plus 10 plus 10 rule. And that's really that place you need 10 places that serve food. And we're not talking about a McDonald's. We're talking about a place that's unique and has a little local flavor. It doesn't have to be a high-end restaurant. It can be a hot dog place. As long as it's a local hot dog place. That's what people want. They want 10 destination retail shops. Uh, you know, and that's something that sells something. Even if it's a trinket, they want something where they can go, feel like they got an experience and spend some money. And then they want 10 places that are open after 6 p.m. That's a real key to look at with your destination. Do you have that? Because that's where people are going to spend money, and they want to spend it. You just have to allow them to, to spend it for you. Now, I wanted to talk about where we are in the state of North Carolina, what the perception is of visitors. So we do something every four or five years. It's called an attitude and awareness study, and, a, and also it's an ROI study. So we go out and look at our advertising, and uh, we take a survey. There's a national firm that does this for us. They're actually out of Canada. Uh, and they look at about uh, 10,000 travelers they find out who's been in North Carolina and who hasn't. And they also find out who's seen our advertising, whether they've come to North Carolina or not. We want to see who's seen our ads and who hasn't seen our ads. And they show us some of the results of that. Uh, but one of the things they tell us, which I always think is fascinating, they tell us what the hot buttons are for those travelers. They ask those travelers, what is important in a destination for you? And these are some of the things they have. And if you don't have this in your community, then you need to get it. Because that's what these people are looking for, these people that are spending. Uh, you know, they want it to be a fun place. They want to feel comfortable. But they also want entertainment. And that's something we struggle with in North Carolina. We're known as a state with natural scenic beauty. Uh, everywhere in the state is beautiful. But beauty is nice, but you don't spend money on beauty. You spend money on entertainment and having fun, and eating, going to restaurants, and dining, nightlife. Um, we look at, as part of this study, when we look at it, it, uh, it asks us uh, what our uh, uh, competitors are. We tell them who our competitors are. And then one of the things they do is they look at the budgets. And these are our budgets. We do this every five years. So this was 2005, 2010, and, and 2014. Uh, and you look at there, most of our competitors have all done what I call the U-turn. Everybody went down uh, with the recession, and now everybody's gone up. Now, we still have it. And you can also see where our budget's lower than every one of our competitors set. That's tough, but we can't just sit and complain about it. What we have to do is just be smarter in the way we spend our dollars. And the way we do that is we share with local tourism offices and we partner on everything we do. It's all a cooperative opportunity for us. Um, then uh, they talk about the, how advertising impacts the awareness of the community. So this is a survey of people who are aware of North Carolina and unaware of us. So uh, unaware people are in red. And those are people who have not seen our ads. That's what they think of North Carolina. The people in the green are the people who have seen our ads. Haven't necessarily visited, but they've just seen our ads. So that shows us that our advertising is working. It's creating more of a positive image for the state uh, and, and really helps us uh, show what, what our advertising does to help people. 
Now we saw a big problem when we did it last year, last time, and it was, people just weren't aware of this. They were spending half as much as Virginia, South Carolina, and Tennessee on tourism advertising. So our awareness had slipped at 36%. And as you saw, when people weren't aware of you, they had a lower opinion of us. So our job was to try and get more awareness. Now we, we succeeded in that. The way we did that is we changed the way we advertised. We used to be very print heavy. We were in magazines everywhere trying to show big pretty pictures. And now travel is being planned on the internet. So we've completely changed our focus. The majority of our advertising is digital. Uh, we're out there when people are planning travel, we're in their face. Uh, and we're getting in front of them and we're trying to find ways to showcase our beauty and the things we have to offer on a digital platform. Uh, this is uh, sort of our scoreboard when we look at scoreboards. This is our advertising budget from 2010. You can see between 2010 and 2014, we actually lost a little bit of money uh, in a budget cycle. Uh, but what I'm really proud of is we draw, drew more people with those dollars uh, because we made them more aware. And if we're driving more people with those dollars, then we're doing our job as a tourism office. And then what I love to show is that return on investment. For every dollar of state funds that, that we're given, we return $15 back into that state treasury. It's about $160 comes to the state, but in state tax revenue alone, every dollar we spend to advertise the state, it brings back $15 in spending, and it brings it, brings it back quickly. So we're excited about that. And then when we talk about economic development, I'm so excited to be here. A lot of people don't think of tourism as economic development, but it really does help. There are some specific examples in North Carolina. Companies that have come here because the CEOs enjoyed it. They came on vacation and they enjoyed it. Now this slide I think helps illustrate that. These are people who have been here in the past two years. That's the green, the yellow is they've been here before, but it's more than two years ago, or they've never been here. And it asks them if this is a good place to live, to start a career, or what I think is really important is to start a business. And what that shows is that people that come here and visit are more likely to come here and start a business and create it. So a lot of times getting that visitor is the first step to bringing that economic investment into your community. Uh, and this is one of my favorite things. These are people that have just seen our ads, so they have not been in North Carolina. But if you've seen one of our tourism ads, you're more likely to think that this is a place where I might want to start a business. So that's really the connection. It's why we're so excited to be part of the EPNC, is I think our tourism marketing can really help bring those businesses here by creating that positive image for North Carolina. Now, a lot of the way we do it is through cooperative advertising, so I wanted to show you a little bit what we do. This is an ad from, uh, from a magazine, and what we do is we go and buy a two-page spread, and then we sell it out to partners, local tourism offices, at a reduced rate, so they can get in a section that's themed to North Carolina. If you don't do this, the next slide kind of shows what, what you're going to be in. This is the same magazine, a different page, with people who go at it on their own. You're competing with Alaska, you're competing with Montana, you're competing with Arizona. The way we do our programs, you're all part of the North Carolina section and we all work together because the visitor that comes to Raleigh most likely is going to go to other places. So we're all in this together and I think it's really important that we develop those regional connections uh, to keep the visitor here. If you can keep him here one more night, that's another $500 in spending that you're going to get. Uh, this is our, our cooperative advertising plan. If anybody wants to know about it, all the ads we do are co-op, so anyone can join us. Uh, we, we always look forward to having partners, restaurants, lodging, attractions join us for the, for the cooperative advertising. All of this is available online at partners.visitnc.com. Uh, that's where our strategic plan is. We also send out a weekly news link, e-newsletter. Uh, please come up and see me after the, the question and answer section. I would love to sign you up so you know exactly what's going on and all the different aspects of the tourism office. Um, and if you're interested in, in participating with us, we'd love to have you. So that's it. Thank you very much. Where else can you get a brand new luxury car for no money down and low monthly payments? Only at Davenport Auto Park, of course. We're talking new Buicks. Top of the line, king of the hill, pick of the litter, cream of the crop. You get my drift. We're talking Buicks, like the 2015 Encore or Verano, Regal Turbo, LaCrosse, Enclave. No money down, zero, zilch, nada. Yeah, only at Davenport Auto Park. It's the real deal.